I've heard a lot from other people about uh, Francisco Marroquin's students and how interesting I would find them. And in my short visit here already, I found that is definitely true, that I've already had conversations with a good number of you and along with faculty and I have been highly interested and highly pleased. And for, I was asked to present, make one presentation for economic students and one for non-economic students. I did the presentation for non-economic students yesterday afternoon and now I'm doing the presentation for economic students. They might wonder about this title, how one principle begat two disciplines. Well, I'm here in a way to tell you how fortunate and blessed you are to be economic students. Because as being an economic student, you master two disciplines for the price of one. You can't dispute the value of that, I should hope. And what I want to do is say that as an economic student, you really are putting roots down in two distinct disciplines. And what I want to spend most of my time this morning doing is laying out the logic of that case and how it came to be. Economics as a field of study really began in the University of Salamanca in the, what I guess that would be the 13 or 1400s. But the founding of economics is conventionally dated with Adam Smith first in 1759 and then in 1776. And what Adam Smith was doing with his economic theory, every scientist is going to have some kind of object into which they inquire. And for Adam Smith and such other scholars of the Scottish Enlightenment as David Hume or Francis Hutcheson, in their cases, the object of their scholarly interest was this concept we call society. That is, there was clear recognition that societies had certain kinds of features, certain kinds of regularities in the conduct of people who lived inside of those societies. It was all there. And yet, there was no one, no office, no political source in society whose task was to make that coherence in society happen. Rather, it just happened as a free gift of nature, you might say. Even though no one tried to promote the orderliness within societies, they just were orderly. And what the members of the Scottish Enlightenment, including Smith and Hume and Hutchison, tried to do was to dig into that situation and say, well, there has to be, there absolutely must be some rhyme and reason behind that observed orderliness. Even though no one tries, is in charge of making it happen, it just happens. And so that became the fundamental challenge of the practitioners of the Scottish Enlightenment starting 
in the middle 1700s. And so what you have there, you ask what kind of a discipline was the work on political economy by the Scottish Enlightenment? You say it was the field of study was what was at the time referred to as political economy. Later on came to be called economics, but it was called political economy back at that time. And the a broader sense since it was the object of inquiry was society. And what a society, but a whole bunch of people living together in close geographical proximity. We're not, we're not pack animals after the fashion of wolves or chimpanzees or dogs or any of these things, but we are similar. To, we are one of the higher mammals. And higher mammals live together. There are regularities that they face in the living together. There is leadership that exists within the higher mammals. From time to time, there arises controversies. Among those mammals, over matters of leadership, it wouldn't be going too far afield, at least according to my kind of, oh, semi-economic imperialism, to say that economics after the fashion of Smith, Hume, Hutchison and company, was alternative a, as a theory of society. One name we apply to the idea of a theory of society is sociology. That, of course, is a term came much later than economics or political economy. But that's one uh, sketch. Now, if what you have then is and this came to be called invisible hand theorizing, spontaneous order theorizing. I have sometimes referred to it as iceberg theorizing. Why would I want to use the term iceberg theorizing? Well, maybe because I wanted to use something different. You know, all of us in academic life from time to time would like to see if we can come up with different kinds of formulations. And what I like about the image of iceberg theorizing is that an I for an iceberg, somewhere around 90% of the surface of an iceberg is below water, of, of the ice in the iceberg is below water. So then to theorize about, if you're gonna theorize about what happens on the surface of an iceberg, most of what's going on in that iceberg will be invisible. It will be below water. As the name invisible hand theorizing describes. Now, economics changed after Smith and Hume and company. In the 19, excuse me, in the 1870s, between uh, William Stanley Jevons and Carl Menger, there developed an alternative approach to economizing action. The, the, Smith, Hume, and company took as a universal principle the idea that 
humans were economizing creatures. What does it mean to be an economizing creature? Well, it means simply that you have, everyone has plans, desires, aspirations uh, of various sorts. And in with those desires and aspirations, as well as potentially conflicts among those aspirations, each of us faces the challenge of doing the best we can with our aspirations that later on in the 1870s started to be called utility maximization. But this title of mine of two disciplines with one principle, if you look at in 1870, there was a, at the time, a subtle change in how economists perceived their theoretical efforts. The, that is what had happened was economists discovered the ability to adapt formulations from the differential calculus into economics. You surely have all heard that kind of aphorism. If the only tool you had was a hammer, would not everything you come across be a nail? Because all you could do was pound it. And this is something that is worthwhile pondering a little bit, and I shall do so a little bit, which is, suppose you were to look into the economics of developing economic theory. So usually economists talk about applying their principles to other people. So you have constructions of such things as <clears throat> consumers as trying to maximize utilities. So you have an analysis that proceeds in terms of postulating utility functions, postulating prices, postulating an objective function. You stick it all together and within the framework of the calculus of maxima and minima, you get uh, sufficient conditions for maximizing utility functions. It, it comes out of that uh, straightforward and, and simple. So this was something within the spirit of the neoclassical movement in economics that began in the 1870s that meant that economists could look out at the world, see people, and say what they are doing is conforming to the principles of utility maximization. And it all worked. You uh, say they're optimizing preferences, given prices, and it all worked. But can you not apply that same principle to economists themselves? And if so, are not economists, as humans, likewise trying to optimize over their actions? That's not normally how economic theory is presented. It's presented as if someone who is outside the explanatory arena 
of, of economics to s make assertions or make statements about what other people are doing. But are not economists just the same as everyone else for whom they apply their economic theories to? Now often, if ever you like to amuse yourselves, find yourself wanting to amuse yourselves, and one interesting way of doing so is trying to invert certain kinds of very standard presuppositions and see where that inversion may get you because there is a very fundamental analytical principle out there is called the methodology of scientific research programs. What that methodology counsels us is the fundamental recognition that we can't reason about anything without embracing some pre-analytical presuppositions that provides a background against which we can proceed with our analysis. So we have on the one hand an idea of when you're studying economics you're trying to learn something about the properties of different kinds of societies, what they're like to, in, to live inside of those different societies, and how it is that the application of power inside societies can influence the characteristics of those societies for better or for worse. Just to think of you know, common European examples, which I'm more conversant with than Latin American examples, that you had in the late 18th century a fairly, fairly peaceful uh, uh, European continent. Uh, then over the early 19th, middle 19th, uh, you had the collapse of Habsburg, the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, German uh, Nazism and so forth. And in a very short time, that world was turned inside out, upside down, or wherever you think about it, it's turning. But, how might economists go about explaining that? Uh, because most economic reasoning is of a sort that posits a system existing in a state of equilibrium until, and that equilibrium persists until that balance is upset by some kind of exogenous force that appears on the scene. And once you have the exogenous force, it does such things as alter relations of production, alters relations of demand, and preceding market equilibria don't work. They're changed, but change comes from outside. But I'd ask you, how is it possible, really, if we're taking societies as our object of analysis, as the classical economists did, you can't have any exogenous shock because everything that happens happens because of some, set, some person or set of people taking actions that upset various kinds of relationships among people who constitute that society. And so what 
the classical economist head was a scheme of analysis where societies were networks of human relationships. Uh, those relationships fundamentally put together within the principles of private property and freedom of contract. And people within those principles could take widely different actions and the features of that society would be generated through the actions of people in conducting their lives. The economic world, the world of economic theory changed quite significantly when the classical economists led by Smith's two big books of the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations gave way to the coming of, Car of uh, William Stanley Jevons and Leon Walraw. I'm going to leave Carl Menger out because he wasn't really, I'll come back to that, because he wasn't really within this neoclassical mode of thinking. But if we bring back in the idea that, well, there is an economics of putting together economic theory because economists are economizing creatures. Everybody's an economizing creature. If any of you have ever read a, I think it's a lovely book by a psychiatrist, I think he's certainly dead by now, named Thomas Saws. And it was a book written in the 60s, I believe it was, titled The Myth of Mental Illness. Now that's a title that pretty well says it all. That is, Saws didn't deny that there are people who could have brain damage in various ways and of various sources that whose minds wouldn't work the way we think of normal people's minds as working and that's a terribly unfortunate thing. But mostly what Saz was talking about was that people are capable of having wide varieties of ways in which they want to use their lives. That's, after all, that's the question that comes back. I've often uh, reminded students when I, I, I like to ask them sometimes what you, they would, what you all would consider the main gift you've received from your parents. And when I ask that kind of question, what I'm looking for people in your capacity to say is it's your very life that is the main gift you receive because by being born, then you are presented with an opportunity to embark on a great adventure. It's an adventure that doesn't have a definite kind of and, but it's an adventure that is your adventure. What are you going to, after all, the perennial question is, what are you going to do with yourself? How are you going to put your life together? And if you look at the world at large and the ways in which people do this, there is huge variety. And I think one of the great features of a free liberal style society is there isn't, there aren't, offices, political offices, that are aimed at putting you into positions, slots, and so forth, that um, as uh, is featured in many parts of, of the world. So we have an economics of economics. And economics is a discipline changed because if you have a hammer and only a hammer, you're going to go around 
pounding. That's what you do with a hammer. That's all you can do with a hammer. That wasn't what Adam Smith and the other classicals did with economics. They sought to dig into the various sources of the coherence that arose within societies because societies were not an object that someone made or created, but were an object that is continually evolving and emerging. And how it evolves and how it emerges depends in all kinds of ways, in part, on what people determine they would like to do by way of conducting themselves in lives, and also in part by such things as the developments of new knowledge, new technology, and these things also change uh, what we do. Uh, and all of which have to be taken into effect. And in this case, economics, say, I promise you, you have two disciplines, and you do. You have, as a theory of society, what the classical economists, starting with Adam Smith, suggest that you can do is dig more deeply into all of the features of the moral attitudes and the actions that people take inside a society because the basic idea of the invisible hand is that such things as, as approbation looking good in other people's eyes is an important part of the orderliness of society. And that means that economics is fundamentally a theory of society and a social organization that is generated through people pursuing the principle of economizing action which is that people fundamentally know what they want to do with themselves. One of the important developments in this line of thought that wasn't part of the classical tradition is the idea of a civilizing process or a civilizing sentiment uh, due to the Central European sociologist Norbert Elias in the 1930s, which Elias raised a very interesting question if you think about economic theory. Look at your economics textbooks in various ways. There you're going to find you're dealing with, say, consumers and producers. What kinds of people are these? Well, presumably they're adults who know what they want to do, and they're going to go about doing it. They're, they're settled into what they're doing as adults. And that's where you get, you know, utility functions, a function of X, Y, Z, production functions, and so forth and so on. These are, this describes a world of adults who are settled in what they're trying to accomplish and they have to work it out in conjunction with making trades that other people are willing to participate in. This is, this is the basic kind of, of social framework behind economic theory. But what does that leave out? Well, everybody who's not an adult, of which there are many. You all are in the, certainly at the tail end 
leaving childhood behind, entering upon the adult world, uh, probably 99.99% there, whatever. I'm not going to make any judgment on that character, but you've, you have been going through a civilizing process. That civilizing process starts with infancy and ends upon taking on adult status. Now, what goes on in that civilizing process is something economists ignore because they don't need it. Because they simply assume that economic equilibrium is a condition that pertains to the trades and transactions that adults make consistent with a system in a state of equilibrium. Simple as that. But if you want to make ob society your object of analysis, as Adam Smith and other company did, then you need to dig deeper. There's more to the an analytical challenge that you face. Because then you necessarily have to get involved in questions of what do and where do infants, what are the procedures by which infants take that walk into adulthood? And this is, of course, where parents come into play. And there are many different ways that this can be and has been modeled with a great deal of controversy going on. And again, if we look about the world at large, we come away with a sense of the immense variety of potential and possibilities that are out there. Now, once upon a time, this would have been back in the, I'm not sure, Somewhere back in the 70s, I'm going to guess, I had moved to Virginia to, uh, Virginia Tech was the university, and I was invited to teach the first basic course on economic theory for advanced graduate students. So I was replacing someone who had left the university and I was going to start teaching economic theory and set the tone for how economic theory was, was treated. Well, I used two textbooks for that course. One was a textbook by Milton Friedman called Price Theory. The other was a textbook by Ludwig von Mises called Human Action. And I recall telling the students that some would ask, wow, those are such different books. And I say, yes, they are different books. Both interesting books, both with interesting lines of thought and formulations. And for the purposes of this class, I'm not going to make one uh, inferior to the other. They're just different. And I don't mind if each of you picks and chooses what you want. If you go between the two, any kind of convex combination you take of those two is going to stand you in a good position with respect to your understanding of economic theory and how to uh, go forward in a world of economic theory. Ongoing and continually developing questions that then comes up is with the world of economic theory of Milton Friedman, neoclassical economics, if you have a framework that 
reduces a economic system to a state of equilibrium. Think for a moment about what you have in front of you. And will you not see that you can... Why do you need to have millions and millions of people implicitly in your model when you can get by with taking an average of all of them? You can get by with constructing a representative individual who by taking a single representative individual and multiplying by N, you can generate all the national income statistics from it. And that's one path that economic analysis takes. Another type of analysis, one based on the ideas of more recent development referred to as systems theory, says that we all exist inside systems of human relationships. Now, how do we think about systems of human relationships? Well, one significant technique for doing that is what is called graph theory. Now, with graph theory, if you all were to take and just draw a few circles on your paper, and then draw some lines connecting circles. What you have, you say, those circles might be people. The lines might be transactions between or among the people. Uh, circles could be businesses. They could be, but the point being that the society is a, a particular type of pattern of human relationship of parts to whole that there are however many parts there are in the population plus the enterprises in society. And in some way or another, it's the interaction amongst those parts that are going to generate what we call now as systemic qualities to those uh, parts. And if we try to recur to the classical economist as I, and von Mises, as I've been doing, then you realize that the social world has many different kinds of social systems of human interaction. Uh, uh, some are relatively free market, some are not. Some of my favorite economists who have theorized about systems are Italians, and I will say a, a few words about them, and then I'll come to a close. If see, one of the important things I would like you to come, hope you would come away with, is the recognition that the kinds of thoughts that we embrace are going to affect what we think our theories illuminate for us. That is, fundamentally, we can't think without theoretical constructions because our objects of interest are just too complicated. None of you, not me, has ever seen this object we call a society, a, a government. I mean, you can talk to about parliamentary buildings and so forth, but our objects are constructed through theoretical efforts to reduce the society to manageable analytical terms. Now, some of those reductions might work decently well, but some don't. And in any case, all of those reductions are going to push your thought in one direction or another, and it may be in a direction that you don't want to go. For instance, if you work with a model of society in a state of equilibrium, you're going to have to work with a representative agent. 
there's going to be no transactions taking place in that model because the transactions have been worked out, prearranged, as part of what allows the generation of a representative agent. Where if you think there is something important about the types and sources of transactions and change, you're going to have to have a world in which transactions occur. In modern macro theory, there are no transactions that occur. Transactions are behind the scene, are assumed away in generating the aggregative statistics. This is what I mean by saying that we all live in a world in which our, the models with which we work are going to channel our thoughts in one fashion or another. And if you find you're uncomfortable with where your thinking is taking you, then the only option I think you have is to develop a different scheme of thought that because every analysis, every theory has both foreground and background. That is in the foreground. What are those things that are really alive in your theory that you're working on developing? And in the background, there's always going to be some things in the back there, but uh, they're, they're not pivotal to your development. That um, I mentioned the Italians, and I'm going to stop. One of the, uh, my own sort of personal favorite Italians, there's, well, there's two of them actually, Bill Fredo Pareto and Antonio de Vri de Marco. Um, and actually, Mafio Pantaleone, so I guess there are three. But the, the usual way you think about societies are well, there's all kinds of activities, and what is the place of government within a society? Well, in many schemes of thought, it provides a corrective force, market failures corrected by government, which I think is a horribly incoherent uh, kind of construct because, well, there are several ways I could go at this. One with respect to Pareto. Pareto made a fundamental distinction between two kinds of environments of human action. One environment was what he called logical environments. The other environment was what he called non-logical environments. The distinction being in that non-logical environments were mostly government. Logical environments were mostly commerce. The idea in logical environments are environments where people make capital investments and bear the value consequences of their actions. In non-logical environments, people don't make capital investments and they don't bear the logical and, uh, consequences of their actions. This is a facet of budgeting as a, as a means of organizing society. It's the difference, difference between budgeting as a way of organizing society and market transactions as a way of organizing uh, societies. And so although I started with the idea that you all as economic students are in a lovely position because you're getting a two-for-one deal. You're getting a first-hand glimpse into economics 
approached as a theory of society organized through the universality of economizing action, you're also getting a glimpse of economics as a science of administrative action. Because every science, every science of administrative action then can be reduced to a problem in the uh, calculus of maxima and minima. And so what happens in many cases, these two disciplines are very congenial. Uh, you have a theory of society that is inhabited by all kinds of people who are engaged in administering the domains pertaining to their ownership. That's various businesses, what they do. But then you have a second um, facet of this, which is very different, which is what happens when bureaucracies and political agents pretend to maximize some non-observable entity called social welfare or something like that, which is an easy thing to mention or to talk about, but it's not connected to anything observable. And so this becomes a place where economics uh, is then becomes a branch of metaphysics as, as against a object of scientific analysis as to the real properties of societies. And um, I think it's easy to have a sense of why apologists for the use of power in society would want to do that because every use of power in society has to be accomplished, has to be accommodated by supporting ideology. If you ever think of how much the, the place of ideology in modern social formulations, ideology, I think, is in the very foreground of generating senses of feeling good about what governments do as against being truthful about what governments do. Consider one American example from the reign of President Obama 10 or so years ago. One of his major pieces of legislation that he got enacted was what he called the Affordable Care Act. Now, if you ask how can government regulation make health care less expensive, the answer, obvious answer is, of course, it can't. There's nothing in regulation that's going to contribute to that, nothing whatsoever. Rather, what it does make it less expensive for some people, perhaps, while also making it more expensive for other people. That's a feature of all legislation, has this feature that within the theory of coalitions that there are going to be beneficiaries who are going to get gains financed by costs imposed on the rest of society. That's, that's a simple matter of the theory of political coalitions. But if you were to say, well, we're going to pass this law 
even though it's going to cost more, many of you something to enact it, that's going to probably generate a lot of opposition. So you have to take a different tact, which would be to say that this is an act that is going to provide social benefits ex that exceed the cost. Now, what are those benefits and how can you measure them? No one can tell you how to do so, but at the same time, it's a complex question that no one can uh, totally determine and know anyway. And so that's why you find so much ideology taking place in political activity that amounts to the pushing of what can't possibly be so because you have to have an ideology to, I think, make sense of the activities that are being uh, organized through, often organized through political channels. And so with that, I think I will quit by congratulating all of you again for the two for one deal that you got because you can, on the one hand, come up with interesting kinds of formulations about the social implications of different kinds of goings on and the sources of the orderliness that takes place in the societies around all of us as we conduct ourselves. And at the same time, you can apply a vocabulary of maxima and minima to the extent you choose to, uh, to the extent that does you some good. So with that, I, again, I congratulate you and thank you.